is twisted and turned with so many turns of events. And yet He found you. He discovered your heart towards Him in this hour. So Lord, I ask You that You would show us how to find the heart of God in such a time, in such a, an hour as David was in right now. And Lord, I ask You for the release of the power of Your Spirit upon our hearts now. Lord, we just wait before You and we ask You to come and empower our hearts. That You would come and forever draw us into that bonfire of the love of God. And we thank You in the name of Jesus. Amen and Amen. Well, this is the ninth session. And we're going to be talking about David being able to find his comfort in the Lord as many circumstances turn and twist, so many turns and twists and chapter 18, 19, and 20. Just turn it on just a hair. We're going to look at 1 Samuel 18, 19, and 20. And look at the many twists and turns that take place in the second season of David's life as he has moved from Jerusalem to Gibeah. This is the, his early promotion. And he's enjoying the favor of the Lord. He's enjoying the favor of man. But jealousy strikes at the heart of King Saul. And of course, there's two different angles, there's two different ways to view that spirit of jealousy that's coming on Saul. Because there are two perspectives that are truth. The common perspective is the enemy is attacking me. Because it is an evil spirit that's motivating Saul. It is Saul's ambition. It's, it is Saul's uh, lack of character and jealousy that's driving him. But at the same time, it's God's school to train David in the love of God. Because in this season, God, God wants David to discover the reality of God in an entirely different season of his life. He's known how to find God in the, in the security and the isolation and the solitude of the hills of Bethlehem. But a more difficult time is how to find God in a time of prosperity. Because with prosperity, the Lord always allows a certain amount of pressure from praise and then an, a corresponding pressure on the other side from those that are jealous from the praise that you're receiving. I remember writing in my Bible this, uh, when I was reading once the, the uh, life of Joseph, and it said that Joseph received the coat of many colors from his father, and he was the favorite of the family. And that Joseph had many dreams and visions about his promises from the Lord. And the story is going on just well. And then there's one verse, I believe it's in Genesis chapter 40, and it says, And then Joseph told his brothers, and I put, I wrote, bad. <laughs> because wherever there's prosperity, there's somebody who is viewing that prosperity as belonging to them. They're viewing that which God gives you as that which belongs to them in some kind of distorted, concocted way. They imagine it as something that's taken from them. But then, in God's bigger economy, that's the safety net that God's putting around David because God wants David to enter into deeper realities of the beauty of the Lord. And He wants David to be tested with praise, but He wants him to be tested with adversity at the same time. Because what God wants to be manifest in David's life is that the reality of David's life is not that he has favor or has adversity, but rather he's in the embrace of God. And if he can get David to the place where David rejoices mostly that he's in the embrace of the beauty of God, then David is stabilized. And so it is the work of the devil, but the devil is God's devil. God has total control on the devil. God can pull the devil's chain any time that he wants, he can remove Saul any time that he wants. So the devil's rage is being used as God's seminary for David. The devil's rage is being used as God's seminary for King David. Because God's training a king that could bring a nation into the knowledge of God. Not just to bring them into material prosperity. He wants a generation to have the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. That's what's on the Lord's heart as he puts David into place. Well, 1 Samuel chapter 18, 19, and 20, it turns and twists so many times. And that is calculated by the Lord specifically to produce an impact in David's life. Somebody says, you know, I'm just trying to get to a place where things are stabilized and what they really mean. 
mean is, I want to get to a place where I can count on favor and blessing without God having to be real and without me having to interact with spiritual reality. There is no such place. God is too jealous for the heart of His people. He will see to it that you are in a situation, even in a time of favor, where you need to grab onto His heart to have reality and to have life. Verse, chapter 18, verse 1. Now remember chapter 17, the great battle against Goliath, king of the Philistines, and the national crisis has been brought to a resolution and the power of God's on David and David's lives about to go into against so many turns and twists here. Chapter 18, verse 1, And when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as he loved his own soul. The king's son is absolutely enamored with the heart of integrity that David has with God and with man. This is a, a very wonderful thing. It's a fruit of the favor of the Lord to have the king's son in that kind of connection to you. It proves itself to be both a blessing and it proves itself, uh, proves itself a source of tremendous turbulence in David's life in the days to come because it's the very king that wants to protect the son's position. He's saying later on, he goes, Jonathan, don't you understand? I'm doing this for you. Quit being so committed to him. Jonathan is an interesting study in and of itself. I'll just go on just a little bunny trail since we won't really have time to develop the theme of Jonathan in, in, in this uh, course here. But Jonathan knows who David is. He's the Lord's anointed. But Jonathan is loyal in the natural to his father. And that's biblical to be loyal to your father. But Jonathan went beyond the line of biblical loyalty and he slipped over into what I call unsanctified loyalty. Jonathan had a loyalty to Saul, though he had a revelation of the anointing on David. And instead of going with David into the wilderness, the time of testing, he stayed in a place of security with his, his father Saul, who had lost the anointing. He stayed in the palace. He stayed in the comfort zone. He stayed in the place of security. He stayed in the place of honor where he knew it was safe, though he knew the anointing was on David in the wilderness. Jonathan should have left the palace and went with David because he knew by revelation who he was. He spoke it a number of times. He goes, I know who you are. Of course, the most logical question is, then why aren't you standing with me? No, I'm waiting for that opportune situation to where I can turn Saul's heart and change all of Saul's army. And beloved, it doesn't work that way. God wanted Jonathan to be trained in the grace of God in the wilderness with David, not in the security and the safety zone of the palace with the favor of man with Saul. And so what happens is that Jonathan stays with him all the time and keeps his father's favor and never ever causes too much trouble. One time he confronted his father, one time only, we'll see it. Then he backs off and holds his peace. From He entered back into the safety zone, never to disrupt his father again. And though jo Jonathan looks like a really good guy and his love and his loyalty, there was a paralyzing fear of man at the core of Jonathan's life. David, his best friend, is being pursued to be killed by his father, and Jonathan challenges it one time and then forever holds his peace and says, well, I guess the Lord's going to have to save David. The tragedy is that Jonathan died in the wilderness as a young man with his father instead of reigning second to David on the throne of Israel. He died in the wilderness with his father, and as far as I'm concerned, out of the will of God. He should have been under the persecution with David in the wilderness and then promoted reigning and ruling over God's people with David all for a long and lengthy life of prosperity. But he could never, ever make those choices early on. And right here, he's, he's committed. He's in love. He knows who David is. The heart is there, but he doesn't quite have what it takes to make the difficult decisions in the hour of crisis. You don't want the spirit of Jonathan on you. You don't want to have revelation on where God's taking the church, but too much fear to rock the boat. And, and all the arguments to stay safely in the palace in the favor of man, in the safety zone, because at the end of the day, you'll die. You will die with Saul. You will end up in a position 
unless the Lord just gives you mercy yet another time, you'll end up in that very, very precarious position of beginning to acclimate yourself to Saul's arguments. Sooner or later, Saul's arguments seem to make more sense after we stay in the council and the fellowship of Saul. When David's kind of, you know, out of sight and out of mind, then the arguments of David seem to grow weary in the, in the heart of Saul. Verse 2. It's probably as much as we'll cover on Jonathan in this whole 20-session course, but I just wanted you to know about Jonathan's life a bit. Saul took him that day, verse 2, and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. So he's now left Bethlehem. He's moved to Gibeah, the nation's capital, if you will. It's not the official capital because the kingdom is just newly formed. It's the first king, and things aren't really established in the way that they're going to be, but it's the capital in as much as they could function with a capital on that day. It's where the king's court was gathered in Gibeah. But did, let's turn that back. Here. Verse 3. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. The problem is Jonathan didn't really keep the covenant. David did. Jonathan broke it under pressure, but David didn't. Later, David was to keep the covenant and honor Jonathan's handicapped child. Mephibosheth, years later, he made a covenant to Jonathan. He said, does anybody live in Jonathan's house, in Jonathan's family line? Long after Jonathan had died, and it comes uh, to pass that Mephibosheth, Jonathan's son, was still alive. He was crippled in both of his feet, but, Jonathan, but David kept his covenant, the covenant that Jonathan did not keep as far as I'm concerned. He never tried to kill David, but he never ever defended David after the first initial attempt failed with his father Saul. Verse 4, Jonathan took off his robe that was upon him, gave it to David with his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. There's been many eloquent sermons preached on covenant relationships based on this passage in 1 Samuel 18, verses 1 to 4. That they made a covenant of love in verse 3. They took off their robe, which means they... They would unveil the secrets of their heart. They wouldn't hide themselves, but they would uncover themselves in one another's presence. It spoke of vulnerability. They gave their armor. They wouldn't protect themselves or shield themselves out from one another's life. They gave each other the sword, a covenant to fight for each other even unto death. The bow and the belt, and there's different analogies for each one of those, but you, uh, those of you that are new with the life of David, you undoubtedly will hear messages on that through the years. It's the one of the classic passages of covenant relationships among humans. And in some of them, uh, you know, interpret the armor and the sword and the bow and the belt and the robe differently, but basically it means I'm going to fight for you, stick with you, and give you everything at the, bottom of the, at the end of the day. Bottom line, and, and the metaphors are, are interpreted a little differently, but, but it's, a, it's a very, actually a fascinating passage to, to develop. Verse 5, here's things that couldn't be going better, verse 5. David went out wherever he, Saul sent him. He was, he was completely given to Saul's leadership. David behaved wisely. He was not taking advantage of his position. See, what happens with a lot of people is they get a little bit of promotion, and then they begin to broker the information with the king in a wrong way, and they use the promotion, that little bit of promotion, in an unwise way, and they break and they get themselves into all kinds of trouble and all kinds of relationships. David used, behaved wisely in the place of favor. He never ever brokered relationships and information for his own favor. He acted wisely in the place of, place of favor, which most people can't. You know, whether it's in, in, the, in the marketplace, you know, the, the guy gets the new promotion. He just can't stand not name dropping and information brokering and, well, the bosses are planning that and all the little people. Oh, and it always comes back around to get him in big trouble sooner or later. But David behaved wisely in the place of promotion. It's a very, very difficult thing to do. Matter of fact, the only way you really can do it is if your identity is in the Lord and not in your promotion. It's just an Im almost irresistible temptation to use your new position and the new relationship, the new access to information, but it always burns you at the end of the day. It will always burn you at the end of the day, but because David, his wise behavior is related to not using his promotion in any personal way. Saul set him over the men of war. That's a pretty significant promotion, wouldn't you say? About a 21, 22-year-old young man set over 
the man of war, he sat over the army in a, in a very high position. Well, of course, he's a national champion, and he's fearless, and he's guileless in his spirit. Highly promoted, set over the men of war. And here's the staggering thing. He was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Saul's staff, in whom David was promoted beyond them, suddenly they liked him. And the reason they liked him, I, I, I believe this with all my heart, he never used his position, again, to broker information or relationship or name drop or manipulate or twist and turn things. He behaved wisely, and the people under him, instead of being threatened by him taking their, quote, position, they saw that their lives were enhanced by David, treating them wisely because David's identity was found in the Lord. For young men and women that are uh, in, a, in, a, in a season where the Lord's about to promote them, I cannot emphasize verse 5 enough to you. I had a couple promotions and didn't always use them as wisely. I look back now and I think, man, if I could have go back there and do that differently, I would have said nothing. I would have taken nothing. I would have had about one-tenth as many conversations as I had. I wouldn't have told the stories. I would have backed off and just wisely acted like a servant and just received my, my identity from the Lord, not from the favor that men had given me. Very, very difficult thing. I, I really, I, I have feeling when I look at that verse now. I look back and go, ooh, I wish I could be 20 again and do a few things a bit differently. Boy, when you have favor, it's just so easy to start talking. It's just so easy to tell the stories. Pass the information and name drop and the whole bit. Verse 6 and 7, now everything's starting to turn. Here's the turning point. Now it happened. What a phrase. Now it happened. <laughs> As they were coming home, when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women came out from all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, with musical instruments. As the women sang and they danced. And here was the song. Saul has slain his thousands. The anointing of God upon Saul is enough for thousands. And Saul, this first verse, you know, let's say it was a whole couple paragraphs. His heart was swelling with pride. They recognized the anointing of God on me over thousands. Yes, yes, thank you. The enemies of the Lord are slain before me. You're right. But then the younger guy has ten times the anointing as you. That's trouble. See, Saul enjoyed being attributed to the uh, slaying of thousands, but the fact there was somebody in his sphere with more in God than him, he couldn't live with it. You know, some folks can easily accept the fact of a, a guy already established having more than them. But when somebody new comes into your sphere that has more than you, that's when the testing of your heart begins. See, Saul wouldn't mind it if somebody else before him had more. That's not a problem. Nobody... Is, is trouble that Billy Graham has a bigger ministry. I mean, so what? But let me tell you this. I don't know if any of you have read the biography of Billy Graham. Billy Graham is probably the most maligned and persecuted man in 20th century in America in the kingdom of God. Now, the folks that have only heard of Billy Graham in the 70s, 80s, and 90s wouldn't know anything about that. But when Billy Graham in the 40, late 40s and 50s and 60s, whole cities of pastors, hundreds of them, of orthodox, fundamental, Bible-believing, born-again believers would bind together. And they called Billy Graham the most dangerous man in the kingdom of God in America to God's kingdom. He was maligned beyond anything that you can imagine. His star was rising. His numbers were bigger than anything that you could imagine. Nobody has a problem with Billy Graham now because he's established, but when he was the new guy on the block, he was disrupting every show in town. That's what the Lord's doing with some of these revival centers. He puts his hand on a little little church of a couple hundred people no one ever heard of in Toronto, and the pastor's John Arnett, and all of a sudden he has 2,000 a night for a number of years, and the whole nation is enraged against this young kid who came out of nowhere. Same thing happening in Pensacola, and it just causes tremendous burden and hassle to establish ministries. But then they begin to stand against them and find anything they can find that's wrong, because when somebody who's new on the scene all of a sudden has more, we get so enlightened to what their heirs are. If we were there first, we become tremendously enlightened as to the things that they continually do wrong and why won't they change them. I just want to say this to you. This is the heart of Saul. 
the heart of Saul. I don't care if your sphere is 10 people or 10,000 people. Whatever your sphere you're operating is, somebody new comes on the scene with more favor. Beloved, it is absolutely going to happen to you. It happens to every Saul. It happens to every David. It happens to every man. and woman of God in history. The Lord is testing to see where you derive your identity. Somebody comes on the scene that has more favor than you. We all imagine ourselves to be David's, but there's more Saul in us than we ever imagined. And we begin to eye them suspiciously. We begin to say, well, they're not as committed as they think they are. And we find every loophole that we can find to come up with criticism to undermine who they are and what their claims are. Verse 8, Saul was very angry. This is something I believe every one of us in this room know a little bit about. Maybe not very angry. Every one of us have been in a situation where a new person came on the scene who had a little more than we had in one or two of the areas that we were familiar with uh, uh, blessing in. So the anger begins. It only begins as anger, but the seed grows. If the seed is not dealt with, it festers and grows, and a full-scale demonic spirit lays hold of you. Or lay, I don't say lays hold of you, lays hold of the person who does that. I'm not putting that on you. Starts as angry. Starts as, I don't like this kid. And all of a sudden, arguments begin to lodge. And then it becomes despair, depression. Then we begin to be, have a fixation against him. And then it becomes murderous. And then it's actually walked out in, in Saul's case. I mean, he just is full-scale demonized. It starts off right here with anger. Anger with jealousy. The saying displeased him. They have ascribed to David ten times more than me, is what he's saying. What now can he have except for the kingdom? The fear begins to love place it. David could have looked at Saul and said, Dave, Saul, I don't want your kingdom. I want to be a lover of God. I don't care about being king. If I have to be king, I'll be king at gunpoint. If God makes me, being king's not what I'm about. Being king is what you're about. That's not what I'm about. I'm not going to take it from you. And David lived to, to prove that out. And even when David's son... Absalom rose up years later when David was king. David said, he can be king. I never wanted to be king. I want to walk with God's what I want to. If God makes me be king, I'll be king. But if he doesn't, I don't want to be king. Saul was afraid of nothing. But it's just the issue that Saul's identity was in his position and not in his reality with God. God is training David so he doesn't become Saul. That's the whole thing that's happening. And it's interesting that when David was young, he had an old king that was Saul. When David was old, he had a young king that was Absalom. The spirit of Saul came against him in every season of his life. When he was young, there was an old king, Saul, trying to wipe him out. When David was older, there was a young man with the spirit of Saul on him, Absalom, trying to do the exact same thing. And in both situations, David acted like David when he was old and when he was young. Verse 9, and so Saul eyed David with suspicion, envy. Put the word envy there. Anger is now turned to jealousy. And jealousy, I mean, is has is, is got a power of rage and insanity to it. When jealousy touches us, we become insane in our thinking. It's a very, very powerful spirit. It's a waiting for us to say yes to it. It will dominate our lives if we allow it to grow. Of course, the way through it is just good old-fashioned, heart-wrenching repentance and honesty before God. God, I am jealous. I want stuff I'm not sure you want to give me. I want it anyway. I'm sorry. Yuck, that felt terrible to say. But that's how you root jealousy out of your heart, with ruthless, ruthless honesty in your heart before the Lord. I remember one time when I was a young pastor, when I was struggling with jealousy. I, was, I had a church that had grown, done pretty good, and I was 24 years old at the time, and the church grew to about 500 people in a couple years, and, and there was a new church that started down the road, and this guy started it, and it grew to about 1,000 in a year, a very fiery, anointed young preacher. And maybe, I don't know, 50 or 100 people from the church I was pastoring went down the way there. And I went down to see what was happening, and you know, I went down and said, hey, I'm going to be David, you know, this is good. I went down there where the guy said some legitimately dumb stuff. I mean, it was just bad doctrine. It was off. And I said in my heart, this is not even right. And oh, man, did I feel that hot displeasure of the Lord. And I just, ah, oh, I was sick. I was sick. I remember driving home that night. I was sick because I knew what was going on. I said, no, I don't do this stuff. 
Well, to my surprise, I did. And I began to come up with arguments as to why my arguments were true. I couldn't press them, but they were true anyway. I said, Lord, you know that was bad doctrine. And you know it's hype. And the Lord, He really pressed me on this. He was not going to let me go. So what happened? The Lord made me go to that to their midweek service for like nearly a year. I don't know if it was a year, maybe nine months, it was a long time. Every Tuesday night, I drove us about 25 minutes away, and all the people that left our church, about the 50 or 100 that went there, oh, hi, my good to see you. We're all buddies. And I'm mad at everybody, of course. And I'm trying to sort through this, because the, the, the uh, young man is definitely anointed of the Lord. There's no question, but definitely some weird stuff. They did that even a couple years later. He rejected himself as heir. But that wasn't the point. The point is the, the Spirit of the Lord was, was calling this work together. But here's where, here's where it got bad. The Lord made me pray for him. Well, that sounds predictable with the Lord. You know, that sounds like something the Lord would make you do, but it got worse than that. Not only did I have to go every night, and my time was so valuable, I went every single Tuesday night. Probably without fail. I might have missed one, but it, it tortured me the first couple. I had to pray and bless them. I had to give a good report everywhere I went. Because the pastors around the city were getting mad at him. Eventually the church grew to 5,000 people. And the pastors in the city, all, many of them rose up against him. And the Lord made me bless him every single time. But in my heart, I didn't like it. But here's where it really got bad. Now, I mean, this was really the Lord making me do this. I mean, I fought through on probably a week or two or three on every one of these issues. and I mean, I couldn't let go of it. He made me tie to him. Well, I tithe to my local church. He says, no, not that tithe, another tithe. I go, Lord, I don't have enough. He says, tithe to him and I'll bless you. I went, <laughs> Lord, this is killing me. I won't say nothing bad about him, I promise. No tithe to him. And in that place, I warred with a spirit of jealousy that I did not call jealousy. I called it godly concern for the people who were getting hyped. See, when I run into that with other people, I say, guys, I've been there, done that. I know what's going on. Just call it straight, okay? I've drank, I've drank that poison myself. I know when I see it. The amazing thing is something broke through, and we became intimate friends. And for years later, after I moved from St. Louis to Kansas City, I would go back in town, and we'd spend five and seven hours of fellowship, and we became dear friends. And it was amazing how the Lord, in that hour, He rooted that evil, that evil seed out of my heart. I'm not saying that, that the, the uh, temptation to jealousy was forever gone, but I'm saying that was the crisis of my early ministry right there. And if I would have gone the other way, I assure you, I would have a different spirit today because that thing takes the life out of you. It dries up all of your veins, if you will. It saps all the energy of your life, this root does. It kills you. Your tenderness goes. Your revelation in the Lord goes. The whole, the whole thing begins to diminish. But I remember the, the struggle. It was a terrible struggle. I hated it. I hated the feeling of it. I hated admitting it. And then when I admitted it, I hated that it was true. The whole thing was ugly. But the Lord says, I'm trying to heal you. I'm trying to take something out of your heart. Verse 10. Well, the interesting thing, uh, at that time, I was teaching the life of David, so I was giving myself a nice little boost, you know. I would just be, I'd be preaching, I'd preach myself right into just being sick. I would be up there, you know, at the, to, the, to the church I was pastoring, telling them, well, they're supposed to be, and afterwards I was just so, oh, I hate this! It was at the very hour I was teaching and I was going through this. Well, what do you know, the Lord just interrupted me by the audible voice of the Lord and sent me to Kansas City anyway, and we started over. Okay, verse 10 happened on the next day that the, that the distressing spirit from the Lord came upon Saul. It was a, a spirit that the Lord permitted to come upon Saul because Saul opened the door. If you will walk in persistent jealousy, the Lord will allow the enemy to energize you. If you will walk in immorality, if you will make those decisions, you will go to the places, open up the, the what whatever avenues of perversion that you put yourself in front of, the Lord will allow a perverse spirit to lay hold of you. No spirit can take hold of you unless you, oh, unless you unlock the door and open it up. Then they can come in. But you have to unlock the door. And the way you get rid of the spirit is by locking the door. And it's a lot more difficult to get rid of the spirit than it is to get it the first time. 
It's a lot more difficult because you have to be so ruthlessly honest within the area of repentance to lock the door, the door of entry, that let this spirit lay hold of you. And I'm talking about as believers. I'm talking about just feeling tormented with a certain thing. And typically, it's, it, it, it has its roots back to opening the door, often to bitterness and unforgiveness, or jealousy or perversion or somewhere. We have to face that thing and begin to call it what it is and to get forgiveness and then get free of the shame of it. And I tell you, you don't want to get a demon because getting rid of it is such a hassle. I know that sounds funny, but it's true. People just kind of curiously walk right in front of demons. You know, they play a lot around a little bit of pornography, a little bit of drugs, and just put their heart right in front of it. It's such a hassle to get rid of that demon once, once you've invited them in. It really, really is. I remember reading a, a brochure a year, 20-some years ago, and it said, uh, Can a Christian have a demon? was on the, on the cover of it. And then at the bottom it says, Who would want one? Verse 11. Saul cast the spear. There it is, right there, the first act. The first act of rage. And I tell you, once you do the first one, the second one comes a lot easier. He cast the spear. He said, I'll pin David to the wall. And David escaped from his presence twice. Now, David's getting a little bit disillusioned right now. David's going, now, wait a second. You know, the king, the anointing of God, the enemies of Israel. This was a great story, you know. And all of a sudden, now the king's enraged. But the king's son likes him, and so... David thinks, well, maybe this is a bad mood, a bad mood this man's in. Verse 12, Saul was afraid of David. There it is, right there. Saul should have been afraid of the Lord, but the Saul was afraid that David was going to take something from him, when if he would have feared the Lord, then nobody could take it. Even if David wanted it, he couldn't take it from Saul. If Saul would walk in the fear of the Lord. David's, Saul's fear was in the wrong position. He knew that the Lord was with David. He knew that he couldn't beat God. He couldn't defeat the Lord in this, and that enraged Saul. It's a curious thing why a man just won't just break down and repent, isn't it? As we're going to look in the next session, David says the sinner, he flatters himself in his own eyes. He always assesses himself so highly when he's in the jaws of sin. He so flatters himself in his esteem of what's happening. Saul was thinking all along, this guy is disloyal, about to disrupt my kingdom. He was flattering himself instead of repenting of his jealousy. Verse 13, Therefore Saul removed him from his presence, made him captain over a thousand. Well, being captain over a thousand, you know, a year earlier was like massive. He was a shepherd from Bethlehem. But now he was captain over thousands and thousands, so he's demoted right here. He's no longer in the king's court in the same way that he was before. His position has changed. So David's experienced a little bit of turbulence going on right here. There's three injustices that happen in this chapter right here. Injustice number one, he's demoted here in verse 13. Injustice number two is pertaining to his daughter. He promised David he could marry his daughter, Saul's, uh, Saul's oldest daughter. And he broke the promise and gave, came up with a new idea right at the wedding day to say, wait, I'll give you my troublesome daughter, the one that will end up getting you killed. And changed, broke his promise and gave him the one for the purpose of destroying David's life. And thirdly, in the issue of, of the dowry, he told David, he says, you have to kill a hundred Philistines to have my daughter. David says, fine. The Spirit of God came on him. He killed 200 Philistines. He goes, no problem. And then Saul said, well, I'll tell you what. I'll give you my bad daughter instead of my good one. I'll give you the one that I know will bring you down. And that's what, David, that's what it says right here in the passage. I know she will cause you trouble. Because I raised that girl. She's troublesome. And she was troublesome. All of David's life, she was troublesome. Saul, that's one thing Saul knew for, well, for sure. Okay. So, the, so the, the, the demotion begins in verse 13. The injustice is beginning to be set in, but it escalates. These are baby injustices compared to what's going to happen in the days to come. But look at verse 14. David still acts wisely like he did in verse 5. David's not running around telling everybody how bad Saul's treating him. I mean, when it says David acted wisely, it means he's holding his speech. That's what he's talking about. It says in chapter 16, he was, in verse 18, he was prudent of speech. He was prudent in his speech. He's, he had a hundred stories against Saul. He wouldn't use one of them. He had a hundred promises broken. He wouldn't tell one of them. He had a hundred injustices. He wouldn't make one of them known. He acted wisely in demotion in the same way he acted wisely in promotion. Why? What's the power of it? They just wiser than everyone else? No. 
He had his identity in something else. So when the, when the promotion on his way up, he didn't lose his brains. He didn't, he didn't get foggy in his thinking because he got a little new attention. And on his way down, he didn't get foggy either because he lost the attention. The reason we lose our wisdom is because we get smoke in our eyes. We get fog in our eyes on the way up or on the way down, and we can't see clear anymore. But the reason David could act wisely, because going up or coming down was not the trauma of his life. The power of his life was reality with God. Trauma in his life was if God hid his face from him. That's what caused David pain, not going up or going down. Oh, blessed is the man or woman that can act wisely going up and wisely coming down. Because I assure you, when you go up, you will come down. When you come down, you will go up. I told uh, our staff some years ago, we were going in a, we were in a good time. And everybody was kind of happy, you know. And things were just going good in about five departments, real strong. And I says, this is great. I said, but I guarantee you, we're going down again. So just don't get too used to it. But I guarantee you, after we go down a little bit, we're going to go back up. And I don't mean just numerically. I just mean in the momentum of the favor of God and the favor of man and its manifestation. I said, when we're down, we'll go up again. We're up, we'll go down. I said, let's not even get, let's not get real connected to where we are. Let's get connected to something else. Because when we go up, I don't want to get dizzy going up, and I don't want to get dizzy coming down. I just want to stay level all the way through it. And right now, <clears throat> my particular life, I'm in a season of favor. But I assure you, in a couple of years, I mean, it's going to get, I don't know what's going to happen, but I, I know how the thing works. And I'm not real dizzy right now with a lot of open doors, and I pray by the grace of God I'm not going to get dizzy when a bunch of doors close. Because they'll open again and they'll close again. And the Lord's saying, Mike, I'm just exercising your heart. I just want you to love me and me love you. I want you to live in that. He acted wisely. That is so powerful. He, he, he didn't make himself a victim. He didn't tell the story. He didn't tell how good he was or how bad everybody else was. There's nothing like that. He was just, it doesn't matter. They say, hey, what happened with you and Saul? You're not living. Oh, yeah, I don't know. You know, it's just I'm moving here now. I don't know. It's just it's in the Lord's hands. I'm not really worried about it. No, 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 really tell me. No, me tell me the real story. No, really. I just, it doesn't really matter. I'm really pretty, I'm really okay. No, no, come on. I mean, we're friends. Tell me the real story. What's really happening? What did they do to you? What do you get? I mean, what, what are they like? I mean, tell me. I understand these things. I mean, it, does, it takes nothing to find somebody to carry that kind of story from you. Everyone in the world's interested in a story like that, but David acted wisely. I've looked at those verses over the years, and they've tortured me in one way and challenged me in another. I look at them and I say, God, I want to do that. He says, well, don't get dizzy going up and don't get dizzy going down. You can hold your tongue in both levels. Therefore, David, Saul, Saul when Saul observed that David was behaving wisely, he was even more afraid. He goes, oh, man. He says, he's not acting crazy because if he acted crazy, he would undermine him. But he's just stable right now. He's happy. He's stable. He's in the joy of the Lord. He goes, this guy's dangerous to me. He, he can't be bought and sold, and he's different. He's different. Beloved, be different. Let some people say some bad stuff about you and treat you wrong and just not go whispered and just, hey, the Lord will take care of it. That doesn't mean the Lord will beat them up. It just means that you're going to get what the Lord has for you. You're going to have a heart growing in love. But all of Israel and all of Judah loved David because he went in, out, and he came in before him. It means he lived his life as an open book before them. That's bottom line what it means. He lived his life, an open life. There was no hypocrisy. He was guileless. He went out and went in. He lived openly before them. There was no pretense. He wasn't living like a secret life over here. He went in and went out before the people. Speaking of a, an open heart. <clears throat> Verse 17 to 27 is the episode with his daughter. That I told you about the first daughter. He says, you can marry. And then he says, but you've got to kill 100 Philistines. And so he kills 200 Philistines. But then he just says, nah, I'm going to give my first daughter to someone else. She's really, she's really got her head on together, right? I'm going to give you my other daughter, though. Again, he said, because I know that she'll be, Verse 21, I know she'll be a snare to him. I know she'll bring trouble. She'll hurt him. She'll end up killing him at the end of the day. So this was an evil act. This was an act of, this was an act of violence from Saul's point of view. This was not just a domestic kind of uh, mix-up. This was a determination to cause David trouble and to get him killed. Verse 28, Saul saw and knew the Lord is with David. And she, he knew that his daughter, Michael, loved him. Saul was even more afraid now because nothing is working and it's gone from jealousy 
It's gone from jealousy in verse 9 to he is now David's enemy continually. Now it's gone up a notch. He's entrenched. You read these three chapters and you can just find the progression even more in depth. You can see the steps. He's now entrenched. He's locked in. You are my enemy. And I am convinced. When I look back when I was 24 years old, that pastor and a hundred people joined him. If, if, if I would not obey the Lord in going to the meetings, that was hard enough. I mean, regularly. Praying for him, not speaking against him, and then tithing to him. That spirit would have got a hold of me. I would have found a way to validate some of the this, this strange things he was saying. And I would have made that the point when that wasn't God's point at all. Beloved, when God's challenging you, I'm telling you, be ruthless. Be ruthless with yourself on these things. Because what happens is, verse 29, the person becomes your enemy continually. You're consumed with thinking about them. That's one of the ways that you can tell. How much are you thinking about them? How much are you thinking about them? This person that's moving in, that's disturbing your turf. If you're thinking about them a little too much, you're on the verge of verse 29. Verse 30. A new war breaks out, and so everything gets distracted. You know, a war breaks out in the Philistines, so this season kind of settles down. The Lord's kind of giving David a little time off here, just let things settle down. But... Look what happens. David keeps speaking wisely. Acting wisely means not... Acting wisely means especially speaking wisely. That's where the strength of it. The strength of it is what he's doing with his mouth and his words. The way he's stewarding the relationships. The way he's presenting information. The way he's handling other information that's being given to him. He's acting wisely. It says it three times in this passage. Verse 5, verse 15, and then here in verse 30. Five times, and it's speaking specifically of his speech. He wouldn't use information to present anything in a way that brought him favor. Boy, that's so difficult, isn't it? Verse 19, it's, uh, chapter 19, verse 1. It's gone up a notch. Saul said, uh, he's not just my enemy. I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him. He said, I'm going to kill him. The, the, the plot begins now. It's, it's, he's not just my enemy. I've I got to get rid of him. i got to get rid of him. It's going to go up one more notch. I believe it's chapter 20, verse... No, I have 23. That's not it. Somewhere. I'll find it in a minute. Oh, 20 verse 33. It adds one more word. He's determined now to kill him. So he's planning here in 19 verse 1. The idea has hit his mind. That's a pretty radical idea to kill the champion of your nation. I mean, that's, that takes a lot. you got to cover a lot of turf. Just, I think I'm going to kill him. Yeah, I think I'm going to. Yeah. No, I can't kill him. Yeah, no, I think I'm going to. No, nah, no, nah, my son will never go for that. No, I'm going to. I don't care. I'm doing it for my son. It goes from that kind of in and out kind of dialogue in his heart in 19 verse 1 to 20 verse 33. He is determined now, and then he never turns back. 20 verse 33, Saul never ever, it, the thing never lifts off of him. Okay, verse 6. Saul heeded the voice of Jonathan, and Jonathan swore to for as the Lord lives, he shall not be killed. Jonathan speaks up for him this one time. Speaks up for him strong here in this season. He says, okay, okay, verse 6, I won't kill him. So verse 7, David is, is restored back to the king's palace. You now David, hi Saul, hi David. Hey, come on over, have some fellowship. Uh, <laughs> Saul, <laughs> how you been? Can I bring my guitar in case you get a funny feeling, a funny look in your face? Verse 8, there was war again. There was war again. The pressure now comes on Saul. There's a new war. and See, these wars create uh, sometimes months and sometimes even a year or two of time passes and things kind of kick into neutral. It's the ebb and flow of how God trains us, isn't it? And it's intense and it lifts. It gets intense and it lifts again. Verse 9, that distressing spirit comes back on it. In other words, which translates, Saul never was ruthless about the root. He never called jealousy, jealousy. He never called sin, sin. He just kind of put it in remission. And then when the pressure came on him, the pressure of war, life's pressures came, the, that demon spirit came on him again. Because when you have a root in you of jealousy, and then the fatigue and the wearisomeness of circumstances, you are, we just, I don't want to say you, I'm not putting that on you, but a person just puts a bullseye on their chest. Weariness with a root of jealousy, 
And they, the spirits are just loving to land on something like that. And then you, you get crazy in your thinking. Verse 10, Saul sought to pin David to the wall with a spear. Then verse 11 to 17, they try to kill him using his daughter, Michael. Saul's daughter, he, says, he tells the daughter, hey, we're going to come kill him. I want you to do this and that. Well, so, Michael goes, I, I love the guy. No. And it helps David escape. And, and Saul's really angry. How could you dare betray me? Saul can't get it together, you know. But the point of the story is, is that the plot is continuing to go on. David, it's, it's off and on, hot and cold. And uh, uh, he keeps coming up with ideas and ways to kill him. So David, in verse 18, fled and escaped to Samuel at Ramah. He goes, he goes down to Samuel. And he goes, Samuel, you anointed me. He goes, you anointed him too. He goes, what's the deal with this guy? He's trying to kill me. I tell you, he's trying to kill me. And he hangs out with, uh, with uh, Samuel. It's a very interesting story from verse 18 to 24. Really interesting story. I, I mean, I don't know what to make of it except for what it says. I just think it just means what it says and says what it means. But Saul's going to send some guys down there to kill David. They go down there and the spirit of prophecy comes on them. They're going down to kill him. They don't care about David because they're going to get a reward from Saul. They care about getting a reward from Saul. You know, David, you know... We've seen you at a distance. We, you know, we kind of like you. We don't really know you. But, hey, we're going to get a lot of money if we kill you. That's kind of what's going on in their minds. Nothing personal, David. We, we really need the money. They go down there, and the spirit of prophecy comes on them. And they just, oh, thus says the Lord. They start prophesying who he is and what's going on in the defeat of the Lord's enemies. And they come back, and they, Saul said, you get him? They go, no, no, we're happy, too. The Lord was with us. Our spirit was invigorated. It was Wonderful. Is that what that feels like? Saul, Samuel? Yeah, yeah. It happens to me all the time. Anyway, a couple more teams go down. Same thing happens. Eventually, Saul goes, I'm tired of you guys. Go, you know, flipping out like this. And so he goes down there. The spirit of prophecy comes on him too. And God stops Saul. And God's telling David, David, I can stop this guy anytime I want. Your problem isn't Saul. Your problem is you need more schooling in the life of in the, in the school of adversity to find out who you are before me so you can be a good king. Your problem isn't Saul. I can get rid of Saul by the spirit of prophecy. I can kill Saul. I can cause a war from the Philistines to divert him. I can take care of Saul any way I want to. Saul is not your problem, David. Your problem is I have a design on you being a mature lover of God and a good king that brings the knowledge of God to others, and I'm not going to let you off the hook because I know you're going to go the whole way with me. So all through David's life, God shows David how God can take Saul out of the picture anytime he wants in a hundred different ways. And that he's trying to let David know that Saul is not David's problem. David's problem is he's immature and God's jealous for him to be mature. That's his problem, if you will. And that God's jealous. And David's going to win. Chapter 20. David is really confused. He says, what's the deal? He goes, what is my iniquity? He's talking to Jonathan. Him and Jonathan have a private meeting and they make a few more oaths and vows to one another. And as they're making these oaths and vows, uh, it's, it's powerful. But here's the first time despair hits David. Verse 3. The very last. He says, Jonathan, as truly as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, there is but one step between me and death. The first time it got a hold of David. First time. He goes, I'm going to die. Jonathan, who's gotten, he has faith enough for David, but not enough faith for him. You know, he, he knows who David is, but not enough faith for him to stand up against his father. I mean, he did once or twice, but not in a way that was persistent. He says, I'm going to die, David. I mean, Jonathan, there's just a step between. It's the first negative thing. And Jonathan tries to talk him out of it. Jonathan vows to him, prophesies prophes to him, and everything else is really something else. Then chapter 20, verse 33, the determination to kill David has come. Here in chapter 20, Jonathan stands up the second time, and actually it's really the two times he did. I said one time earlier, but in chapter 19 and chapter 20, he stands up against his father, but never again for the next 10, 20 years. Well, I guess he dies in maybe seven or eight years after this, but he won't stand up against his father again. This is it. The two times he found out it got him in trouble, when he found out it got him in trouble and jeopardized his relationship with his father, he refused to stand for the Lord's purpose. Beloved, that, that's powerful. When he knew it jeopardized his position with his father, his status, he refused to take a stand for the Lord's anointed, for the Lord's purpose. The determination. 
right there, chapter 30, 22, verse 33. Then I'm going to end with this. Chapter 22. Oh, where's it at? Somewhere where David says, I know I'm going to die this time for sure. Anyways, oh, I'd hate it when I, that happened. Anyway, there's one more time. I, I wrote the wrong one down. David said, I know I'm going to die. It goes beyond what he says in chapter 20, verse 3. He takes it up a notch, and he says, this is that. It's, it's over. It's over. I know I'm going to die, and it's, it's over for me. And David, the, the despair gets a hold of him. And, uh, oh, there it is, chapter 27, verse 1. David said in his heart, Now I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul. It lodges in him in the most powerful way. Just uh, It takes a while, but it finally really lay, it's a lie, but it lays hold of him. Despair gets a hold of him in a very, very powerful way there. Amen. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.fotb.com. Thank you.